Good morning, everyone. My name is David Sandelo, and I am the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia, and I am delighted to welcome you to this session on the Belt and Road Initiative and green development. Um, this follows uh, a, a workshop that we had yesterday and the evening before, which we were really honored to co-host with our partners at Renmin University in Beijing. And I want to thank the Renmin delegation, in particular, Professor Xu Qinhua for coming and for all of her work to pull together our conference here. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, today we have uh, a public discussion of all the issues that we've been talking about, and we're, we're really thrilled at the high, high level and expert speakers um, that we have to talk about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, let me just tell you what we're going to do from a programming standpoint. We're going to have two different panels. Um, each one is going to have a lead-off speaker, and then I'm going to invite panelists to the stage, and we'll have a discussion, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience for discussion, too, because we really want to hear from you for, about your thoughts and, and your, your questions. Let me uh, just a, a, f a few opening comments um, on the Belt and Road Initiative, because I think for some people listening, both in the room and on our uh, online streaming audience, they may not be familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative. I find when I travel in Asia that there is great awareness of the Belt and Road Initiative, but in the United States, much less. Um, the, so the Belt and Road Initiative is a massive infrastructure program that was first announced by President Xi Jinping in 2013. Its, its scale is, is enormous. Uh, it will involve more than a trillion dollars in thousands of projects, in dozens of countries, over the course of many, many years. And it, its implications are profound across a wide range of areas, including geopolitics and capital markets um, and the natural environment. Actually, in the United States, I find one of the first questions I often get from people is, where does that name come from? People are very confused. What is a belt and what is a road and what does it have to do with all this? Um, and here's my understanding, and our Chinese speakers can correct me if I'm incorrect about this, but the belt refers to the ancient Silk Road that runs across Asia. And it kind of, when you look on a map, I don't know if this is part of it, it kind of looks like a belt across Asia. Um, now the road, this is a little confusing to me at least, the road refers to a sea route, not a, a road like we usually think of it, but it's the maritime road that goes along the south part of Asia to Africa and to Europe, the historic um, Silk Road. So that's where the name Belt and Road Initiative comes from as I understand it, but again, I, I can be corrected. Um, so, for the past couple of days, we've talked about the Belt and Road Initiative broadly, but we've especially focused on its impact on the environment and on sustainable development. Um, and its implications will be very profound in that area. And, and we started, um, we discussed the scope and scale of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and then we discussed the Chinese government's uh, guidance for a green belt and road. And this is a guidance which was put forth by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, um, and it's published in both Chinese and English um, on Chinese government websites. And it's an ambitious document. And it says that the Belt and, under the Belt and the Road that parties will, I'm just gonna quote some of the language. Um, they will formulate environmental protection standards and codes for infrastructure. They'll increase environmental protection service and support major infrastructure construction projects. They will popularize energy conservation and environmental protection and practice in sectors such as green transport, green buildings, and clean energy, and enhance green guidance for corporate behavior. And I, I, anybody interested in this topic, I commend you to go look at the guidance. There, there's a lot of interesting material there. So we discuss that. We also discuss what's actually happening in the Belt and Road Initiative and the extent to which the projects on the ground are, in fact, sustainable. And there were different views on that topic, and we're going to get into that today. So, so that's the basic background. Um, as I said, we will uh, we'll have some speakers and, and, and then some questions. For anybody listening online, you can ask questions as well. Um, uh, use uh, hashtag CGEP events, Center on Global Energy Policy events, so to ask by Twitter, hashtag CGEP events. Um, and please follow us at, uh, at Columbia U Energy on Twitter. So let me, let me start by introducing our, our first speaker, and it's really, it's an honor um, to introduce him. Chairman Fu Cheng Yu um, is with us today. Chairman, Chairman Fu is, I, I, 
the best known energy executive in, in China. He was chair of both Chinese National Offshore Oil Company and Sinopec. Um, extremely distinguished background, uh, widely w respected. He, today he's a member of the Chinese uh, Political uh, Consultative Conference, and he is a board member of the UN Global Compact. And more important than any of that, he is co-chair of our China Program Advisory Board here at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Chairman Fu, the floor is yours. David, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, we're very happy to be here and uh, talk about the better rules and my, my answer some of the questions. I just give you some uh, very uh, brief uh, my understanding and introduction about the Baton Road. The, as uh, David mentioned, and the road uh, belt re referred to in ancient China, the trade communications of, of goods and wood, and was through uh, China, Western China, through the Middle East and to Europe. And this normally we call the, uh, the belt. And then the communications and uh, transformation of goods through China to Africa to uh, make Mid Asia, uh, and not Mid Asia, to uh, East Asia, and that called the the road, thick mar marine uh, maritime road. So this was actually proposed by President Xi Jinping in 2013 when he visited Kazakhstan, and also visited Indonesia. He mentioned about these two things and why he, at that time, talked about this road and the belt, or called belt and road. And if we trace back at the time of 2013, when global economic recovery after 2008 financial crisis was very weak, not like today, U.S. economy recovery, relatively speaking, is strong. But by the 2013, U.S., European, Japan, you see all the major economy bodies was very weak of recovery from the economic crisis after 20, uh, 20, uh, 2008. Trade, especially, was very, very uh, weak. If you count back, uh, there are three consecutive years, the trade at that time around the world, almost no growth. So this is, this is one of the concerns to the major economic bodies, how to keep global economy stronger and drive the economic, uh, economic growth around the world. And by that time, China's contribution to, to at that, the, the, uh, the time's GDP growth around the world is about 30, 30 percent. And unfortunately, after 2010, or especially 2012, China's economic growth slowed down. And we have continuously uh, slowed down for three years, up to today, and maybe six years already. And before this slowdown of GDP growth is normally uh, around 9 and 10 percent. And we draw down to 6.7, this year 6.9. So this is a big slowdown. And then how, where are the new uh, the powerhouse to stimulate global economic growth. This is one thing that China was experiencing and the world was experiencing and the leaders around the world, especially Xi Jinping, he was considering how to get the new driver force for global eco economic growth. And secondly, we found out that the trade protectionism during that period was stronger, 
growing everywhere, populism and the protectionism, anti-global, economic globalization. And then after we all see the black swan happening, especially Brexit, and including the president election in US, all the world people watching this as considered as a black flag, as a swan. So what causes, why people around the world, they anti uh, the uh, globalization? Mainly because the benefits, the growth of economic growth around the world did not being shared by majority of the members in this group, especially in some of the countries, like in US, within the country, rich and poor are separating sharply. So rich is richer, poor and poorer, and that's why there's a 99 and 1%, there's why there's an occupation of Wall, uh, Wall Street. So this is something that leaders around the world need to sort out in order to continue the economic globalization, which is really beneficial all the people, all the economy. However, the benefits did not distribute it well. So based on those major elements, President Xi Jinping thought how we can distribute the globalization to other countries not just major countries. How to let the other members of the global, uh, the global economy to share the growth and better let the people to, to get the more benefits. And plus how to get the new momentum or new power hubs to push the global economic growth. And then we found out when we China powerhouse slow down, we need to find a new driver force to push global economy forward. And then you need to find the area how to move, to make the, the area, especially the, pure, the poor area, to grow so, so, so as to there's a new powerhouse. And then this is a, the initiate made by President Xi, by China, and gradually they have more thoughts about this, and they call it Belt and Road Initiative. And what the, the major philosophy and the goals and the ways to deliver those things. The major philosophy in China to about the Belt, belt and Road is how we can build our shared future through consultation, through collaboration. The key is a shared the future. It's not one country, not few countries. So this is a major philosophy now adopted by Chinese uh, 19th Party Congress. So this is, a, we, we put this in our uh, uh, government top priority, to sh build a shared future through wide consultation and co jointly or together contribute to this. So this Belt and Road actually involved with 69 countries about uh, six, Six, uh, 6.4 billion population and about one third of total global GDP involved. However, majority of the countries uh, in this uh, Belt and Road involved is uh, developing countries where there's a need a tremendous investment in infrastructure, tremendous growth potential to growth in that area, and the people in that area, they need to promote, uh, pro promote their quality of life. So the, a lot of potential was in this area. However, the outside world, especially the developed world, 
U.S., uh, European, need to put a lot more money to the growth there. And, but China, it thinks, because the, uh, the econ economic situation today, developed countries, they don't have enough power to do this. But China, they, we have a little bit of capacity, but we can work together with others, not just using our own, own power, our own, uh, our own capacity. So China, in, in the last 40 years, we were started in a very low level. We don't have almost nothing to build our own, not to say help others. However, we know our past. We know how we grew up. And then we know how we can work together with, that, with those developing countries. And then we all can grow together. So this is a very... Uh, initial thinking and the principles, but those philosophy will build through joint work and to build a, a, a road for peace, a road for pro prosperity, a road for opening up, a road for innovation, and a road for uh, connecting different civilization. I think this is a basic concept that I can share with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Tu, and let me invite our panelists for the first panel to the stage here. So, um, Nabuo Tanaka, um, and Professor Xu Qinhua, and Li Zhengfeng, um, and Professor Chen Youngjun. Uh, if you'd come to the... Thank you. Well, uh, let, me, let me start by introducing our panelists here, we have a really remarkably distinguished uh, group here. Starting on my immediate left is Nabuo Tanaka. Um, he is today the, the chairman of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo, but um, is known around the world as the former executive director of the International Energy Agency, where he served with great distinction in Paris for a number of years. Um, and then we have, um, to his left, uh, Li Zhengfeng. Um, who I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, that Zhang Feng is the father of the renewables industry in, in China. He helped to write the key legislation um, in the middle of the last decade on renewable energy law. He served in, as Secretary General of the National Center for Climate Strategy Studies um, and recently was awarded the Zayed Future Energy Prize for Lifetime Achievement, a, a significant global award. Um, then we have uh, Professor Xi Qinhua, who is um, Professor at Renmin University, Director of the Center on International Energy and Environment Studies there, um, and my counterpart in organizing um, this conference. I want to thank her in particular for all her leadership um, and tremendous work uh, on this topic. Um, and then to her left, Professor Chen Yang Jun, who is a professor at the Business School at Renmin, an academic leader in industrial economics with a specialty in market economics, theory, and reform. Uh, so, Thank you all. Let me start with you, um, uh, Nabo Tanaka, and just ask for your perspective on the Belt and Road Initiative, either, either from Japan um, or from the perspective of a global energy leader. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, I'm very much delighted to be invited uh, to comment on this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, especially the Green Belt and Road Initiative, because certainly IEA, International Energy Agency, where I was the executive director some time ago, focused a lot of China's role in the energy perspective. And uh, the most recent World Energy Outlook uh, just uh, released about a week ago uh, focused on the future of China. Uh, and uh, uh, there are plenty of uh, energy issues in China, but China will be the, anyway, the largest uh, player of energy sector in the future. In terms of usage of coal, the coal uh, consumption will be reduced uh, in the future in China, but uh, oil, renewables, um, nuclear power, gas, you name it. Anything uh, China is uh, going to use for economic growth is enormous. So the impact of the Chinese policy 
internal domestic policy as well as uh, foreign policy certainly impacts the global energy market. So it, it has a good impact, of course, because it's a huge demand. So certainly the suppliers are very happy to serve uh, the Chinese uh, demand. But at the same time, some concerns because uh, China's policy of securing energy supply means price could be higher or more competitional rivalry for uh, the geopolitics in the such country like in the Middle East or how to deal with Russia. Uh, and uh, Australia is certainly aiming at China. And uh, so how this Belt and Road Initiative in a way, to make it green means using more renewable energy or more efficiency in, in the future, uh, and maybe using gas to replace coal. So this uh, Belt and Road Initiative has a very interesting energy perspective. So um, I think, uh, let's say, China as a major player now quite well understand what the market responds to the, uh, uh, say, China's domestic policy. So for that, I'm, uh, uh, my point is how China can be, uh, let's say, uh, taking these uh, market elements into their decision making. Because China's policy itself is not, it's for domestic purposes of growth or pollution aversion or CO2 emission reduction, but it always has an international implication, and which is not small, it's very big. Um, I will give, make one uh, interesting uh, geopolitics, which I had experienced some time ago as the executive director of the IEM. I was invited to the G8 summit meeting held in Italy, L'Aquila, in 2009. Uh, the Berlusconi, the prime minister of Italy, hosted it. And uh, uh, he hosted the lunch with African leaders. And the person who was sitting next to me was Gaddafi of Libya. And he talked a lot about African problem caused by the so-called colonialism of the West. And he criticized uh, what had happened uh, since then. Mubarak, Zuma, the other African leaders echoed him. Then came Obama. It, this is the first summit for Obama. And uh, Mr. President Obama said, I know about Africa because Africa, I have a cousin in Kenya. And he mentioned that the problem in, in his country, Kenya, was the corruption. Bribery, the government, to, he must pay the bribery to the government official to get a job. So Obama said, ah, the corruption is an issue, but this corruption has nothing to do with colonialism. That is what he said, total silence at the table. But then came Merkel, uh, Sarkozy, Brown, the Western leaders say, right, corruption is the issue. So total discussion of the G8 summit moved away from colonialism to the corruption. But story didn't end there. Recently, I had a chance to talk with the then Japanese ambassador to Libya. And what he said to me is hilarious. He said, ah, this is very interesting story because Gaddafi started cleaning up cor corruption the year after. And he said, until the last moment of his, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say he, he lost his life uh, in the civil war, until he died, he believed that the United States would never come to kill him by invasion. He said in lunch, the very interesting story, that uh, he was asked by Americans and Brits to discourage North Koreans to have a nuclear weapon. And he did it, but unfortunately he failed. So the current problem happens. And he, of course, he gave up nuclear weapon himself and he tried to clean up the corruption. So he followed all the advices from the United States, but US came in to kill him. So this sent a terrible message to North Korea, unfortunately. And my concern now is Iran. The US is a party to the nuclear agreement with Iran, 
but Mr. Trump is going to abort this agreement. And this may send another terrible message to North Korea. So Iranian situation, Libyan situation, Africa, Middle East, geopolitics is very much linking to the Far East geopolitics, North Korea. So to make stability, and China needs a definitely the stability in the region, as well as in the Middle East, to make its economic growth stable and sustainable and peaceful. So my point is that, yes, United States certainly should play a very important role of stability of the global community, but China certainly in its growth in this initiative of Belt and Road should play a very important role for geopolitical stability in the Middle East. China's role vis-a-vis -vis North Korea is very well recognized at this moment by Japan, by US, by anybody. But uh, certainly, you know, this is a very important and interesting initiative in terms of energy efficiency, sustainability, but at the same time, very important in terms of geopolitics. That is my comment. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks, um, um, Li Zhenfeng, um, what role do you see uh, renewable energy having in the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, thank you, David. I would like to speak in English because of the jet uh, lag and also with the Chinese. I can be more thorough and comprehensive. I don't want to talk about renewables. Uh, Mr. Tanaka uh, mentioned that topic, uh, so I want to pick up uh, the Belton Road. Uh, Mr. Hayunke, my former boss, uh, has said that everyone can have a different uh, interpretation of Belton Road. Different economists and professors and politicians in the world may have their own readings. So I want to share with you my reading. So from the academic perspective, we can study Belt and Road. Uh, this uh, initiative, to many of our friends and also Chinese friends, uh, may have different readings. And an important interpretation is this, namely, uh, China is dissatisfied with the uh, world order after the Second World War. It wants to grace something, and that's uh, mainstream. Uh, in fact, it's not. In fact, uh, China is particularly glad and happy uh, about the world order created after the war, uh, because China is a permanent member of the Security Council and also an important member of the World Bank, and also an important member of uh, APEC and G20, and an active participant, and is very happy as a participant. It has also benefited from uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, why the Belt Road? Uh, a lot of people have uh, tried to interpret this uh, from the economic point of view in order to create more growth. That's not correct either, because uh, in its leadership uh, of the world for over a century, the U.S. has been following the development in Europe, the Americas, and some countries in Asia like Japan, Singapore, Korea, and Australia, and New Zealand. So the Belt and Road uh, area countries have been neglected uh, as if uh, it were a forgotten corner. And that's the area where the economy is the least developed, uh, with a lot of uh, turbulence and terrorism hobbits. Uh, it's not only a threat to China's growth, but also to the entire world, in particular the development of Europe and the stability there is a huge threat. Uh, as uh, Mr. Tanaka said just now, Libya, after the Libya incident, uh, Europe has become a refuge uh, of uh, refugees. It used to be a paradise, a clean soil. Uh, now it's uh, no longer there. And that's one backdrop. And the second, we need to remember that uh, in the last two years of his administration, President Obama kept saying that China is a big power. He was not able to fulfill his uh, China did not fulfill his responsibilities, and it was just hitchhiking. And of course, as a big country, it should really bear its responsibility. That's the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative. We need to turn the turbulent area into a stable one. 
not only to solving the problem of China's backyard, but also solving a, a weak link uh, problem in the world. But how can we succeed in this? And uh, there are several approaches. First of all, we need to learn from the Marshall Plan. We know it helped with the reconstruction after the war, but it can't uh, lead us to our destination. Because after the war, you had uh, the two camps in the East Europe and uh, West Africa, which could easily unite on their own. So there was no shared value or culture, and the economy was uh, backward. There was major political division. Is there any way to manage well? So many have thought about China's experience. A lot of young people may not understand this. In the 1970s and 80s, China was more or less like this uh, in the economic state of now the Belt and Road countries. So all the provinces were more or less like warlords. Uh, and in cultural, we had Muslims, uh, Buddhists, and different cultures by provinces, although we had a Mandarin. Actually, people still spoke different dialects, but uh, through those decades, uh, there has been greater unity. And a major experience from this is uh, seeking common ground while setting aside differences. So we just uh, work together on common ground, but in terms of differences, we don't have to uh, insist on unification. For example, there is the Han uh, ethnic group. Uh, we have Muslims. They some the first one eats pork, the other eats uh, uh, lamb, <coughs> and they need to respect the, the the right of the other in eating different uh, meat. So you can see in China there are special tables or even canteens for the Muslims in different institutions in China. But it's difficult to solve the entire problem of the Belt and Road. Uh, so it in requires the efforts of all countries, including the US, Japan, and European countries. Uh, two days ago, we had an economic forum focused on BI, and the f former a uh, former prime minister of Japan uh, visited, uh, also attended the meeting, and he uh, very much uh, we very much endorsed his idea, namely co-prosperity in East Asia. So, in this regard, we hope to work together to s tackle the problems in this region. First of all, we need to start with cultural inclusion seeking common ground while setting aside differences, second, seek economic growth, and third, our energy is <coughs> What is energy? It involves uh, the spiritual and um, material needs uh, for the lifting of our uh, living standard. With energy alone, we can't solve any problem. For both development, developing countries in the 1980s, energy was a major attraction. People thought that it would solve the poverty problem. In fact, it's not. So it has more to do with our cultural recognition, um, harmony, stability, and economic growth. And based on that, there will be a greater need for energy. With that demand, what means do we have to have clean energy <coughs> or renewables to, to, to solve the problem? So uh, an urgent task now for the Belt and Road Initiative is to see common ground. While well, putting aside differences, we know there are a lot of Muslims in the Middle East different, with different sects. How can we bring them together? As uh, Mr. Tanaka said just now, can we respect uh, other people's views? We are not doing that. Uh, there was a better side where the Gaddafi, we did not praise him. And Iran has a better side. We don't uh, praise, uh, praise it either. We are scolding it every day, just like students. They are all teachers. I am a teacher myself. For a good teacher, you you no, student rather. If you praise him or her every day, he makes progress every day. And if he makes uh, some progress, you still scold him, and so he's uh, or she ends up by thinking that I'm just a naughty boy. So for China, the Japan, uh, India, and uh, all the big countries, we need to think about this. We can't use our own values to judge others. We need to respect others and seek the commonality and recognize every step of progress so that the uh, countries can uh, have stability and with the economic need, with the cultural cohesion, we can engage in energy. Otherwise, be it uh, the nuclear or gas or, or renewables, uh, we can't really develop energy. So 
So that's why the initiative is different from Marshall plans or China's own uh, construction or the reconstruction of Japan after the war. So we need to make a good study of this, how uh, the entire world and the region can cooperate together. Finally, I must say that uh, the Belton Road is not just something Chinese, it's for the world. Because according to our calculation, there are 65 countries <coughs> involved, some other countries to Brazil, for example, even though it's not on this belt or road, it still wants to be involved. So things like this uh, we need to study properly as to how we can work together as uh, the U.S. was pushing the Marshall Plan to help with the reconstruction of Europe, or just as the World Bank, when they help with the reconstruction, we need to find a way through the Belt and Road Initiative, especially to help the Middle East and Central Asia, the two single uh, uh, blocks, to help uh, create uh, a better opportunity to, to for peace and prosperity, and then we have the ground for play for the energy specialists and economists. Thank you. Um, you we um, uh, entered into a memorandum of understanding to do some work together and just um, then started talking about what would be a good topic to do some research on. And you suggested the idea of the Belt and Road in green development. And could you just explain why you thought that would be an interesting and important topic to work on? Um, we, Renmin University, uh, the delegation uh, is composed of uh, six professors uh, from School of Economics, uh, Business, Finance, and uh, International Studies, and also, um, I forgot another one. <laughs> so, but we, we, we really, oh, yeah, School of Business. We really appreciate that, David, that you uh, help us to hold this very beautiful and successful the workshop yesterday, um, mainly focusing on the energy, the Belt Road Green Development, and today the public event. Um, uh, uh, because in this room, it's very meaningful to our Yunnan University. Just in October, our premier, Liu Yandong, together with our chair lady of our university, they held some activity to promote the China and the US, the culture exchange mechanism here. So now we're following their visit to have our research cooperation with each other. Let's go back to the Belt Road first, David, if you permit, um, because um, I think that because I'm also leading an institute of Russian, Eastern European country, and also Central Asia. So it might be that I'm very first involved in the Belt and the Road. Why I said that? I told you the story that in September of 2013, one day I was hiking in a suburb, and I received a calling from the CCTV of China. Someone told me that Professor Xi get preparation. After two hours, our president will release one very new concept. And I asked them what concept. They said, keep secret that you will know it. Then you explain it. So that is the new Silk Road initiative, if you know it. So that is the beginning of the Belt and the Road initiative. I could say at that time, I never imagined that that New Silk Economic Road initiative will become such a big ambitious, not only Chinese, but the whole world developing the strategy initiative. So um, I mean that Belt and Road the initiative has been growing itself. That is. Um, so for me, this generation, I'm in my almost 50s. So we have been suffering from lots of time. So I was sent to the county when I was graduate from the college. And then I was sent to very underdeveloped area to help the university in Guangdong, Huizhou, if you go to 
uh, China, you can pay visits. And then I was sent by the government to study overseas. And then I was sent by the N NDRC to be staying in Japan, in IEJ and APERC, learning a lot energy issues and studies from Japan. So what does it mean? That just as my teachers, Fu, Li, Han, and other, they shared with all of you that Chinese have been developing not only dependent on themselves, they are, depend they are depending on the cross-edged cultures of all the world. Without other countries, we, I don't think that we can be developing now by here. So the Belt Road, we think if it can be successful, it should be work together. So then I come back to the energy. Um, we prepared some new, newly published by the US one famous press about the China's foreign energy policy and also China International Energy Corporation. And uh, we do want to share with some of you here. But I have two questions. If these two questions someone can answer uh, in front almost the most famous, the, the energy, the big man here. So we will share the book with, with them. The first question is, so um, energy will bring the conflict or the cooperation. Another story in that. Just a week before I gave my teaching to our University of National Defense, 130 the senior commanders from all over the world, then they are discussing about energy will bring something, the conflict or the cooperation. But most senior commanders, they answer is conflicts. So if the soldiers, they think that it's conflicts, it will be conflicts. And even during the class, they, they argue and even fight with each other to decide it's cooperation or conflicts. So I'm, we are waiting for your answer. Mm -hmm. Second question is, we, we, we often said that it's the energy security, but someone defended on me that, no, we cannot say it's the energy security. We should redefine the energy security into the energy safety after the nuclear crisis of Fukushima in Japan because the energy should be relevant to the human being, sustainable development. So how do you feel about it? Because in Chinese, security and safety is the same word. It's called anquan, but in English it's different. So <laughs> these are two, two, two questions. So um, I do, I, 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 in my understanding, energy is first Attribute is commodity. That is, where is the market? Where is the need? So there is a cooperation. So I don't want to put them into the geopolitical situation background. The more there will be lots of conflicts. Okay, I'm finishing my my um, speaking, and I'm waiting for your questions, if you would like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor, uh, Professor Chen, you're an expert in market economics. What, what's your perspective on the Belt and Road Initiative? And yesterday at the workshop, I mentioned the BRI. And I'm one of the uh, first group of scholars studying BRI. I think it has uh, three concepts. The first is a green development concept. And China is winning uh, to share the dividends of uh, development with other countries. And the second, uh, this is an overarching uh, open up plan or program. And the third, most importantly, it is an international cooperation program. It is a business model. And uh, this uh, idea has been widely accepted. Why? Because uh, if we look at the supplier and the Demand, demand side, after 30 years of uh, reform and opening up, uh, we have uh, abundant 
production capacity. We have a high-end technologies represented by high-speed rail. We are able to build bridges, roads, and rails. And we also have uh, nearly uh, four trillion U.S. dollar forex. And for the BRI countries, they have a huge demand for infrastructures. Just like China was in the 80s and the 90s. Therefore, if we combine the supply and the demand sides, and we can develop a very good business model, and that's why we propose BRI. The reason why we name it BRI because we want to leverage uh, the ancient cultural uh, heritage. And uh, so, first, we have a plan to combine and integrate supply and demand before we come up with uh, the name of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And I think uh, this may help you to better understand the essence of uh, BRI. And uh, with regard to business model, I believe through BRI, China can utilize its uh, funds in the form of uh, concessional loans or soft loans to help other countries to enter into contracts to build uh, the coal-fired power plants, highways, and uh, high-speed rails with uh, the assistance of China. China can release its uh, capacity, and uh, the recipient country can find a shortcut to complete the projects and to address their urgent needs. And that will create a win-win results. So that is a business model. And uh, so the recipient country has to repay the loans. And uh, so we know after we build infrastructures, uh, they have uh, proceeds, uh, like a power tariff, uh, the high-speed rail tickets. And even when we build in, um, infrastructures in the, on the campus of universities, we can also uh, produce proceeds. So through these infrastructures, they, uh, the local governments can have a larger tax base and more revenues to repay China. So after several years, both China and the recipient country can get what they need, and that will create an ideal result. And that is an abstract concept. And uh, because it is feasible, so China proposed this business model to share with the rest of the world. And uh, we see four years after its uh, inception, it has been widely accepted by the international community. In May, um, both US and Japan and other major international organizations and the media all send their representatives to the uh, BRI forum. Uh, the attendance has was uh, the attendance reached the thirty thousand, so they see this big business opportunity. Of course, when we implement the BI, we may see a cultural, political, or economic conflicts, and it also carry risks. And we need to find ways to address those risks. However, I believe BI is feasible. That's why we propose it. And we are able, I am confident we are able to overcome the bottlenecks and the uh, difficulties in the, at the time of uh, world economic recession. At 3%, if we are able to restore the growth rate to 4% annually, uh, that will be one trillion US dollar gap in terms of uh, needs of funds. And where can the funds come from? I believe PBRI can create one quarter or one fifth of those funds, and that will help rebalance the world economy and uh, facilitate the early recovery. And China, if China did not raise uh, BRI in 2013, the world economy will remain stagnant. And now with uh, the pro uh, proposal of BRI, I believe we are able to better balance the world economy, and that will benefit the whole world. And now let's come back to energy. Uh, yesterday we discussed, uh, we devoted a whole day uh, to discussing uh, the energy. And I worked in power plant for six years before I went to university, because uh, that was uh, the time of uh, cultural revolution. And I understand the energy a, a little bit. So there are conditions to use uh, energy. And uh, uh, 30 years ago, uh, in county where I worked, we convert coal into oil because oil price was cheaper. Uh, that was uh, uh, before the financial crisis. So uh, in the power plant, I converted the device from coal into oil, like the nozzle. 
uh, because the oil was cheaper and it, uh, it was able to replace coal. And then we phase out uh, those uh, old power plants because we then had a super critical power plants. And then we upgrade uh, the equip, uh, e equipment and uh, to reduce the coal waste and the coal consumption. So I think the evolution of energy depends on the conditions. For the renewables, it is not about uh, standards developed by China. It depends on the conditions. And I believe BI, BRI can contribute to the utilization of new energy and the green development because BRI brings a lot of uh, big projects and new technologies and uh, uh, upgraded power plants, which will replace the old and the dirty power plants. If we don't build a new, uh, new plants, they will continue to use uh, polluting power plants. And the BRI is not for energy revolution, but it will facilitate the development of uh, uh, energy revolution. So that is my understanding of the role of a BRI in green development uh, as a former worker at the power plant. And uh, I would like to share my observations with you. If you ever worked with, for a power plant, then you will understand the importance of the technologies and the conditions required for the, up for the upgrade. Thank you. What we've heard is a very positive vision of the Belt and Road Initiative with aspirations to um, lift people from poverty and, and help to improve the global environment. But I, I, I sometimes hear in the United States much more negative commentary and suspicion about the Belt and Road Initiative. And there's concern that the Belt and Road Initiative is, is um, projection of China's power and that many of the projects under the Belt and Road Initiative are not actually clean. Um, so I just want to, maybe starting with Chairman Fu, ask, ask for your reaction to that type of suspicion um, about the Belt and Road Initiative when you hear it, and, and, and then any reactions from other panelists as well. Well, this is a really uh, a good question, and I believe a lot of people are concerned about this. Uh, you see, after President Xi Jinping initiated this, who are very happy? All the poor countries, hmm. developing countries. Why last uh, this year when they have this uh, they call Better Role Initiative Global uh, the International Cooperation Summit, you see all those countries hmm. related they participate, and so that that is because they want to develop themselves. And why Western, especially U.S., concerned about this? Because U.S. Western companies, they are developed already. And they set up all the standard for all our livings and the political, economic, all the standards setting by this. What they worry about. So why China do this? If you are going to break the current system, current uh, order, and to set up another one, this is naturally people were thinking about this. And second, especially U.S. U.S. is the leader of the world. And you, you did not discuss with me how you're going to do this. You do this, that means you are setting up another, another rule, which is against me. Hmm. So this is a natural, but I believe this can be settled through good communication and work together. And there's... Uh, a lot of work need to be done by both China and the Belt and Road countries working with developed countries, especially the U.S., telling them what this is going to be, where this is good to you, and if there's, you believe where this is bad to you, let's talk about how to eliminate the negative part, and let's do the good part together. So. The parties involved, they just stand in their uh, part. There's no good communication. And second, I, I just let you know that China's thinking, why China's thinking this way? Because our history, our language, our culture, our development level, all different from Western. 
So we have our, our we set up our own thinking model, own thinking way, in the same thing. And we we are thinking this way, you are thinking that way. That might be all good. However, there's no clear communication, causing a lot of misunderstanding. And even China today, they can do a lot by themselves already. But I just let you know, no Chinese leader really to uh, want to be in U.S. position to lead the world. China, not to say their capacity, they don't have such a capacity. They understand it themselves. Second, they don't have such thinking requirement to lead the world. Mm. And as uh, Professor Lee said, we are not against current global system. Why? Because we are benefited from it. You see, how China grow so fast? Because we joined the world system. So why are we against it? And you see today, even U.S. President uh, uh, Trump say we, like using our way, protectionism. We American first. But China still say, let's do economic globalization. Why we are benefited? So why we're against the rule? So, but there's a lack of communication, lack of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, uh, so this is something that the, uh, the government, politicians need to do, businessmen can help, and the education, the scholars can also help promote the communications and get a better understanding. Thank you, Chairman Fu. We have time for, I think, one question. I see a question right here. Uh, we'll be very quick, and then we're going to turn to uh, the next session. Thank you. Richard Jordan from the Royal Academy of Science International Trust. Question for Pre uh, Professor Lee. The dream and vision that Belt and Road is in the people-to-people -people aspect, you have indicated that culture can help to drive renewable energy. Could you elaborate briefly? And in 15 seconds, the answer to the two questions is military doctrine writers need to incorporate cooperation, not conflict, into military doctrine on energy. And two, security means uh, improved living standards, happiness, harmony for all people. Thank you. <laughs> That was very efficient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to answer your question in uh, such short period of time. I think it's quite simple. And uh, China uh, focuses on energy security. If you have a uh, uh, safe, uh, secure life, you don't need, uh, if you don't have a secure life, you don't need energy. So we need to stabilize first before, and uh, we need to develop first, then we need energy. And previously, we know uh, Libya has very good infrastructures, but after war, it was destructed. Uh, so was Iraq, destroyed by war. Uh, Syria was prosperous, and now it was uh, in ruins. So f first, we need a sp stability, and uh, uh, cultural integration is very important. People-to-people -people, uh, communication. Uh, we need to seek common grounds where she offering differences. Even uh, big powers like China, we need to respect others. That is uh, uh, the minimum we need to do. And uh, I also want to comment uh, or add something to Fu's presentation. In China, too, we are still studying it, uh, trying to do perfect it uh, and improve our understanding. So don't take uh, BRI as something Chinese, is something global, something we should engage in. We should, can come up with ideas, for example, what Japan thinks or American thinks uh, it, it can do, and also the, the Indian or the Chinese uh, thinking about it. For big countries, I think we need to recognize this reality, although all countries are equal big or small, but uh, bigger countries uh, must be more influential Bigger countries normally don't have that many. Uh, if they don't start the troubles, then smaller countries will also be peaceful and calm. And so President Xi, <coughs> on all occasions, he would say that, that there is no reason at all for two, for two countries like the US and China to have confrontation or conflict. And there is no reason whatsoever 
uh, China and the U.S. not to unite and cooperate. And the same applies to the relationship between China and Japan. So if there is uh, harmony between bigger powers, there will be harmony in the world. So uh, what we are doing is to contribute to society uh, and stability through energy, but not to replacing everything. everything. Uh, this session, I do see that, um, that uh, Lee has become a member of the faculty now at, at uh, Renmin University with his jacket there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, please join me in giving this panel a big hand. Thank you, everyone. Our next panel is going to focus in particular on capital markets and financial issues related to the Belt and Road Initiative. And I'm very pleased to invite to the podium for opening remarks, Hanwen Ke. Uh, and uh, Hanwen Ke is a leader in the energy sector in, in China. He is the former head of NDRC's Energy Research Institute, widely known for his expertise uh, on many issues related to energy and has been instrumental in thinking on these topics. Um, and he'll kick us off, and then we'll have a panel. Hanwen Ke. Thank you, David. I'm very glad to be coming to Columbia University to share with you something. Uh, David uh, asked me to talk about the funding and capital-related issues uh, concerning BRI just now. Chairman Fu and um, Mr. Lee already talked a lot about uh, Belt and Road. But to be clear about the financial issues related to BRI, uh, we still need to come back to what the Belt and Road is. Uh, there was already some elaboration. Actually, we borrowed the concept from ancient China for the uh, initiative, but there are a lot of uh, modern elements. Essentially, I think there are three major elements. First is a Chinese solution, namely, just now uh, Mr. Fu said that uh, against the current backdrop of uh, globalization of the world economy, when the world is uh, dwindling in size to preserve the world economic system, and to have plural, independent, balance, and sustainable development, China came up with the Belt and Road Initiative. It has to be a pluralistic, uh, balanced, and sustainable in terms of development. In the past, the country grew pretty fast, but the countries, uh, over the 60 countries along uh, this Belt and Road, uh, were mostly underdeveloped. So there must be balanced uh, growth. It's also an idea for deepening regional cooperation while to also building up uh, learning among civilizations. For example, I cited one example yesterday. Countries in Central Asia, there are six of them. And in China, there are six uh, major uh, provinces and cities. So it's a major area also facing complex uh, political uh, situations. For example, a uh, lot of ethnic groups uh, and Muslims uh, are gathered there. So we need to deepen our regional cooperation in Central Asia so that the West of China can uh, uh, develop in lockstep uh, with those countries. For example, we need to respect the Muslim traditions, but we are also against the extremist uh, elements so as to preserve uh, stability in China's West and also stability and security in Central Asia, in, West, uh, in the West, and in Europe. And thirdly, it's China's uh, responsibility to push uh, forward the world governance uh, system towards uh, greater justice and rationality. We believe that this interlocked uh, development by accommodating the development uh, of uh, backward regions. But we, even though we are developed, we still have a gap with the US. And so we need to develop 
not only on our own, but also her other countries and regions. So that's also a responsibility for China. So there was one question yesterday. Is it uh, to do with China or with the world? That's pretty complicated. First of all, this idea came up from China. So I think it's China's uh, initiative, China's init uh, responsibility. But we need to everyone to be involved for the construction because uh, every country is a sovereign state and needs to do its own things. And a lot of countries along the Belt and Road came up with their own blue plans. China has its own. So do those uh, blue plans uh, need to, uh, blueprints uh, need to be integrated? We need to share the consensus and accelerate the growth. So we need to consult together, build together, and I'm talking about this uh, building together, and that involves funding. Uh, the previous speakers uh, said that uh, it's not uh, China's assistance or China's Marshall Plan, but rather it's co-construction. Where does the funding come from uh, to, to get the funding for the initiative? China, first of all, has to come up with the, the money. So we have three major banks and one fund. It's called the Silk Road uh, Fund built by China. There is also the, the AIIB and Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization Bank, and also the BRIC uh, Bank. So with the three banks in addition to the fund, so that's China's financial contribution or China's financial input to this initiative. But there must also be construction, a lot of uh, infrastructure and involvement of a lot of other countries. So China's Development Bank will uh, be turned into one to focusing on infrastructure development through financing. Uh, what's the scale of the China Development Bank? Actually, in terms of size, it's bigger than that of the World Bank in terms of uh, funding. So the countries along the road, Kazakhstan and the other uh, Turkmenistan and other Central Asian countries also need to come up with money. They can uh, tap their uh, oil and gas uh, resources by selling to China and other countries, and with the money, develop their own infrastructure and people-to-people -people exchanges. In the past two years, some countries now, three countries are already issuing the, as Poland, uh, Hungary, and another country, they are uh, issuing sovereign uh, bonds uh, in China. So the countries involved also need to invest. So they hope to issue the $1 billion of uh, sovereign bonds in China. The interest rate is higher than the savings rate uh, for the Chinese population, so the Chinese population uh, just bought it. So it's uh, backed by the government and can help with uh, infrastructure construction. The third point, the Belt and Road, is an interlinked uh, mode of uh, development. So it's not only pushed by the central government. Many of the provincial and municipal governments uh, in West China also invest a lot. Um, many of China's state-owned enterprises also invested. In Yunnan, for example, it's involved in the initiative. It wants to have going through uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and India. So that must be, uh, it's going to build a route. So linking the Yunnan, Guizhou, Guangxi, and Guangdong provinces which will also have uh, great infrastructure for ports, uh, railway, and airports. The Chinese businesses are also actively involved. They have uh, state funding and uh, private funding. And the general public along this Belt and Road, as we said, it's uh, to have a balanced uh, development. China's idea is 
to, to promote uh, exchanges uh, between and among different uh, civilizations. So the countries along this route need to have a comprehensive uh, exchange. So many Muslims uh, may come to China to run stores, factories, and so the old uh, things uh, for worship, for example, to Muslim inhabited areas in China, tourist gifts, and the Chinese can also run restaurants and hotels in those countries. So these are mainly first the small and medium-sized businesses, and that's what's to be uh, tackled under the Belt and Road, namely through waiver of visas uh, to ensure security and safety for travel and the safety of securities, or rather of the facilities, is more for the private sector. So that's the guarantees provided under the initiative. And finally, the Belt and Road Initiative is also attracting countries like the US and Japan to participate. And so we need to have a greater ties with international institutions. Uh, for example, with ASEAN, uh, Russia, and the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization through the uh, meetings of presidents of uh, central banks, and also with the World Bank and IMF, we signed uh, agreements on uh, increasing the funds, and we also have the Fuzhou Development Reconstruction like, no, rather, it's the European uh, Development and Reconstruction Bank uh, to have more loans for Central Asia and also multilateral development, and also two hundred and forty million a billion dollars of uh, foreign reserve. Uh, Citibank can also be involved if David. Uh, as a banker, if he has money, he can also participate. So that's what the Belt and Road is about. So my understanding is that so the Belt and Road uh, is something built together by China and countries along the Belt and Road. We are not <coughs> insisting that the certain countries need to be involved. Uh, may I also add uh, that uh, so for Central America, we are rather for, for China and America are rather we need to have a type of big power relationship have mutual confidence and manage the risks and differences and uh, separate uh, trade and energy issues uh, from political issues to benefit mankind so the belt and road uh, for our two countries is secondary Then to the stage, our panelists, uh, Michael Eckhart, uh, Deborah Lair, and Zhao Shijun. Um, really uh, very fortunate to have these distinguished panelists with us. Um, Mike Eckhart is the Managing Director and Global Head of Environmental Finance at Citigroup. Uh, Deborah Lair is Vice Chair of the Paulson Institute and a longtime leader on green finance issues. And, even join us closer, Deborah. Uh, and, and Zhao Shijun is um, a professor of finance at Renmin University. Um, and so we're going to focus in particular on capital market implications and the financing of the Belt and Road um, in, in, this, in this session. Let me kick it off by asking Mike about this topic. Um, uh, this is an ambitious, ambitious program. <laughs> 呃，这个几万亿人，呃，几万。Finance, Mike. There's 212 trillion dollars in the world's capital markets. Done. Okay. So, supply of money is not the issue. The the issue is bringing the the business purposes together with the capital. Now, if I could set aside all political considerations, okay, no U.S., China, whatever, no political. If I could set aside trade and trade flows and globalization, don't talk about that. I'm agreeing with uh, uh, Mr. Han's closing comments. Set these aside just for our conversation. Set aside economic issues like who wins the contract, who makes revenue, who gets promoted, where are the jobs. Put that aside. 
Now, I only want you to think, then, about the flow of money. That's all. You don't see anything else. You just see the flow of capital in the world and, and what it's doing and where it is and why it would flow from one place to the other. Because that's what city manages. That's what we do. Uh, we manage, we're in 160 countries. How can we be political? We can't. Uh, we're in 48 of the 65 Belt and Road countries. The next uh, largest bank in that region is in 12 countries. I mean, we are the dominant global bank. We don't call ourselves the World Bank. Somebody has that name. But if they didn't have that name, I think we might be called the actual World Bank. I once commented to one of our bankers that I was noticing, I was hearing that lots of money was flowing from China to Africa. And did he know about that? Because this man runs our accounts. And he goes, Mike, that money from China is flowing through Citibank's accounts. <laughs> we see it going by. Whose accounts do you think is moving in? We're the one in all those countries. Why are we in those countries? Because our original business from 200 years ago and city is 200 years old, uh, is trade finance. So not, not doing capital market activities, IPOs, bond underwriting, very, very, uh, very fancy things, uh, and, and, and not, lending, not lending money per se, but just financing the flow of trade. This is our core business as a city. Each of the big banks has somewhat different business. And, and so we're, we're already there, and so city, we held a Belt and Road Conference in Beijing six weeks ago. And we had 200 corporate clients come to it to discuss their business under the Belt and Road. Again, forget politics, economics, it's just flow of capital. And we will be the ones managing their flow of capital. Indeed, we will be participating, city will be participating in China's investment in the Belt and Road countries. Because what accounts do they go through? And so this is our core business, and on top of that, we would do bond, green issue underwrite green bonds, do IPOs equity for companies, we'd loan money to companies and all that, but the core business here is just managing the flow of money. And so with that perspective, again, not politics, this, the Belt and Road to me is similar to Europe's move in, in colonizing so many countries 300 years ago. It was the flow of excess capital they had more money than they could spend internally, so they invested in Africa and Latin America. They had that capital. Then you had the U.S. in its globalization post-World War II, even post-World War I, uh, and, because we had excess capital, and we could invest it around the world, hence globalization. It was the flow of capital. Now we see China with some $4 trillion, quote, in the bank, uh, and it's sitting in U.S. Treasury bonds, actually. And so Treasury bonds will, <laughs> when, when China sells tr U.S. Treasury bonds to put the money in Belt and Road, it's going to affect interest rates when that kind of money moves around, okay? So there's big implications here, and I agree with Li Jinping's comment that it's not about China. It's really about world economic development as capital flows will now, that are stored in China doing relatively nothing, our, our excess capital, are going to flow into economic purposes in the Belt and Road. So I have two, two questions that I think we face. One is in that rush of capital and the, and the power of profit making to drive what's done, uh, will the issues of sustainability hold? Will it be done in a sustainable manner or simply maximum profit? Uh, that includes the energy systems, whether conventional or renewable, environmental controls, climate emissions, and energy efficiency of everything. Will, it, will that extra capital be invested to make it good, not just the cheapest and the easiest? That's, that's one question. And the second is the sources of that capital, because it won't be just Chinese savings. It'll, it'll, it'll coincide with other capital that will join it. Where's that other capital coming from? And will, the choice is, will it come from the public sector, governments, and multilateral development banks and other development banks, or will it come from the private sector? Will that $212 trillion filter in this and will companies put their capital to work in the Belt and Road, or will they be squeezed out uh, by the more powerful public sector capital? I believe we can do this. I, I think it's going to work out over time. It'll be led by China Capital, followed by Public Capital, MDB, Multilateral Development Bank, uh, followed by private sector. Private sector will come last, and as the risks are reduced in these markets, the private capital will come in. I think it'll be very successful over the next 100 years. I think it's one of the great economic advances of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.
Um, Professor Zhao, could you talk about the Chinese sources of capital? Where will they come from here? Is this uh, the National Policy Bank's going to be providing a lot of capital, or, or Chinese state-owned enterprises, Chinese private companies? Where's the Chinese capital coming from? Uh, uh, good morning. I fully agree with uh, Mr. Han about the funds. So I first I want to share two observations. First, the source of funds for BRI and the need, fund needs, including the uh, funds provided by China. Uh, second, in terms of uh, use of funds for BRI, how do we incorporate uh, green development best practices and standards and to implement these uh, practices and standards so that the BRI countries when developing themselves, do not repeat the same mistakes of industrialized countries and China. That is a polluting environment first, repairing it uh, later. So I think uh, these are two subjects I want to discuss. First is uh, funds for BRI. And the need of funds is huge. According to a latest estimate of ADB by 2030, it re will require 20 trillion US dollars in infrastructures in 65 countries alone, which is huge. And uh, on the supply side, look at China between 2005 and 2016. For BRI countries, China directly invested to over 200 billion US dollars in, in the form of FDI. After the International Forum on BRI, China mobilized the government funds of uh, 880 billion RMB, which is uh, 14 billion US dollars, of 140 billion US dollars. That is uh, the government funds for BRI, including, like Mr. Han mentioned, uh, this comprises of uh, policy banks in China, especially the Axim Bank and uh, CDB, uh, the Silk Road Fund, and other funds to supply uh, the BRI capital needs. However, compared to the 20 trillion US dollar of, of, of funds needs, there is a huge gap. So we need to mobilize more funds. On a global sp scale, we have uh, abundant supply of funds, but it is uh, distributed unevenly. For the BRI countries, they are mostly underdeveloped countries. And they are underdeveloped in terms of uh, financial market and the capability to mobilize funds. Therefore, to a large extent, they need a fund supply from China and uh, other c developed countries, as well as uh, major financial markets. So uh, the, I think the meeting venue is uh, close to Wall Street. And Wall Street is uh, global, uh, the world's largest capital market. And we need to think how to mobilize the funds from Wall Street to invest in BRI. And that is what we need to think about. In fact, and many financial institutions and uh, uh, companies in Wall Street are very interested in BRI projects. They have approached the Chinese financial institutions and uh, companies, and they started cooperation with them. Uh, with regard to BRI projects. Therefore, for the source of funds, in addition to government funds from China, I believe to a large extent we need to mobilize the private capital, including the funds from capital market and the financial market. And then that this raises a question, how can we integrate government funds with uh, private funds and uh, capital market funds and to build a portfolio in order to supply funds for the BRI projects. And that is a subject for us to consider. And that is a research subject for us. And China has a proposed initiative or pilot. That is a PPP arrangement, a public and a private partnership, and uh, some other structural financing arrangements. In this, uh, the government funds will take the lead and help those companies to carry, uh, take risks and reduce costs in order to invite commercial funds 
So this is the pilot China is running, and that is uh, my first subject about the funds. And the second is the green development. It's fair to say, since uh, the end of 1970s, China started its reform and opening up, and China underwent a road of uh, industrialization. After 40 years or four decades, we find that in the course of development, we encountered some problems, including the environmental protection and the pollution. So after four decades, we are managing the environment through different means, among which an important one is uh, financial means. In other words, we propose higher standards for the financial investors about the environmental protection to constrain them. So China is the first country in the world to propose to establish a green financial system. In August 2016, the uh, PPOC took the lead together with seven uh, line uh, ministries in China to issue a document on establishing a green financing system, uh, which will be implemented across financial, Chinese financial institutions and the financial markets. So the Chinese financial institutions when, it is, when they are making investment overseas, they have to implement those standards. Even when they invest in their domestic projects, their subsidiaries, they also need to implement the green requirements. It is our hope when we pr promote the BI projects in, in financing, in the process of financing, the Chinese financial institutions have to provide green financial services. Furthermore, we also expect other countries, including the financial institutions from Wall Street, can also implement the green concept when they make investment. When the investment in BRI projects can all meet the green standards and the requirements, then we can be assured that the economic development of BI countries, the industrialization and the modernization of those countries will minimize the environmental pollution. And I think this will produce much better results when we expect those countries to do this on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, could you talk about the green finance that uh, Professor Zhao was just talking about and, and how you see that developing globally and what, what role will the Bolton Road Initiative play in that? Great. Um, certainly, as we've heard from the speakers earlier, that, that the aspirations for the Belt and Road Initiative are immense. It's going to be the world's largest uh, infrastructure development project ever. It's going to be the way to build cultural ties. It's the way to do training and upgrade education. And of course, it could be what, um, if successful in green finance, it could be transformational along the 65 countries and three quarters of the world's population. That's a really heavy weight, and it's dependent on a lot of particular issues. But if there's any country that could do that, certainly it would be China in terms of driving it. For the Paulson Institute, which was founded by former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, this is a very natural fit in the interest of his, of how to look at capital markets and how it can be used to drive development and green, drive green development. And we've been watching with great interest and working carefully with the Chinese government over the last three years as they have gone from basically zero in green finance to now having the world's largest green bond market to have what may or may not be within the next year, but most likely will be the largest carbon market, and many other issues that they're developing very quickly. But even before they get to the point of launching their own carbon market, they already are looking at becoming a major exporter of green finance. We see that in the development um, and the programs that they've done through the G20 in creating the first green finance study group by launching the green bonds market, and they are in active negotiations with a number of countries in creating the kinds of innovative financial instruments to make that global, and in discussions <coughs> and plans with countries along the Belt and Road starting in Southeast Asia and developing their own carbon markets. And clearly, some of these smaller countries like a Cambodia or Vietnam will not have the depth 
necessary for trading. So what will China do? Allow them to trade on the Chinese carbon market. What does that mean? That China will be the developer and the driver of what the standards will be in terms of green finance. That can be um, beneficial in many ways because as we had a discussion about yesterday, what is very different in what China does from, say, the United States is it's very much top-down and government-driven. So the government can determine what the definition is of green. We see this that it is possible in the context of green bonds. That's what they've done, and that's why they've been able to grow the market so quickly. On the other hand, as we look at some of the lending that is being considered along the Belt and Road Initiative, the four policy banks, the development bank, and others each have their own definition and their own lending criteria, which creates already within China some confusion. So what does this mean then in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative? As uh, some of the other speakers said, the demand for infrastructure financing is immense. It could be up to two trillion a year. And most of this development is not going to be in the United States or in Europe. It's going to be in lesser developed countries where the political situation is risky, where the economic returns could be large, but these are mega projects by and large with long-term considerations and they lack the kind of political stability that capital, and as Mike said, there's plenty of capital out there. That is not the issue. The issue is how you create the kind of framework where public and private funds are going to go in and finance this. And when China did have $4 trillion in foreign reserve, it looked a little bit better uh, in terms of the numbers that the Chinese government was going to put behind it, then as we've seen the drop, although I guess recently the foreign exchange has been going up again, but a drop down in terms of what the foreign exchange reserves are. But, but by accounts, the Chinese government is only going to uh, cover about 10 percent of that two trillion that's needed, so the rest of that has to come from other sources. And in many instances, it's not going to come from the Pakistans and the Bangladeshs and the other countries where a lot of this investment is going on. So we had uh, experts meeting just a few weeks ago in Beijing, including with the Silk Road Fund, which has clearly been one of the leaders and is driven by, by policy and by political, cons political considerations in investing in some of these areas. And it's clear that there's still major concern over how to start to get the kinds of returns that are necessary unless you're doing this almost for political or philanthropic purposes. So political risk to start with. There are no private sector mechanisms or insurance products for investing in a number of these countries and they need to be developed. There aren't the sophisticated foreign exchange instruments that are also necessary at a very practical level, particularly since major infrastructure projects don't tend to have major returns and they're long term. A few of changes in the exchange rate in these countries, which is pretty typical um, when there's political unrest, can make a significant difference in then private sector calculations and investing. And if governments or if the correct government policy can be developed to create the incentives and to mitigate some of this risk, we could see that Chinese money and Chinese policy could be really a driver of what um, could be done in terms of green development along this, this road. What's really needed in many ways is creative thinking, and that's why this effort and the Paulson Institute is doing a number of things in China to look at how can we think in a different way about developing the kinds of innovative financial instruments that need to be developed to create either public-private partnerships or um, private sector uh, driven capital going into these kinds of projects. It's great that City is doing that, but City is one of the few that's really doing it. As we look at what a lot of the investment banks are doing, particularly in the United States, it tends to be generously in the philanthropic area or related to what is philanthropy. And we haven't seen it as part of the mainstream of lending in a lot of these markets. For the Paulson Institute, we have been working with the Chinese government in developing our own innovative model, and we have created a green fund, the U.S.-China Green Fund. And it's a partnership between the Paulson Institute, although we are a non-commercial advisor, and the Chinese government, with a commercial fund under it that's run with commercial criteria, investing in green energy efficiencies in China. 
And the goal of the fund is essentially to bring U.S. technologies, which tend to be a little bit more expensive than those that could be procured in China, although they, at this stage at least, are more sophisticated and help bridge that gap. And the project, uh, the fund has been in operation. It just celebrated its one-year anniversary, and already we have a significant number of projects, and it's growing rapidly. And the financing, the committed financing, is about $3 billion. And we've been approached by a number of different countries looking at how they might be able to take on this model and use it in their own country and working with various NGOs, and, and we have as part of this, because I think government policy really is an important part of this, a not-for-profit that's related to the fund that looks at policy issues specifically related to the financing and makes recommendations to local governments where we invest to ha <coughs> discuss not only how they could upgrade their policies, but also, very important, how they can actually apply these technologies, because we've learned that it's even some of those basic issues like how to apply the installation appropriately that are some of the biggest hurdles to some of these technologies being adopted. But if China can be successful in all of this and its green financing and really become a major exporter in green finance as it's become now one of the leaders in thinking about green finance, it could be truly transformational along the countries and where it's going to be doing these investing. Well, thank you, Deborah. Uh, let me, we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to throw it open to the audience for any questions you might have. Um, uh, I, right here and then right here. And I think we've got a standing mic right here. If you could just uh, come over here and give us your name and affiliation, please. Of course, the devil is always in the detail, and um, I may be wrong in my understanding of it, but I believe that the countries that participate in Idai Ilu are allowed to have um, duty-free entrance of trade into China. Is that correct? Uh, Please. Yeah. Uh, in fact, He says, I don't need a, mic or a headset. Actually, countries along the Belt and Road, according to my judgment and observation of them, at present, the domestic uh, capital market is far from enough. We need uh, five kinds of uh, flows. Uh, one is uh, commodities. The key is to help those countries if they want to develop together with China, help them with the development by providing more in terms of experience, China's development experience, but also some other uh, facilities. But personally, I believe, as you said, in its development, in addition to hard infrastructure, namely bridges, uh, telecommunications and transportation. What's more important is the soft part of infrastructure, namely institutional building, including, for example, the financial market uh, infrastructure, the financial and commercial laws and corporate governance. They have to be established. And that, I believe, is another kind of uh, infrastructure. The two, the soft and the hard, have to be combined uh, so as to have a better dovetailing with the current system. And just now, my colleague also mentioned that in our own development, we have uh, integrated China into the global market uh, system. You was that China ought to consider seriously inviting the United States and Japan and other industrialized countries to join Idu, Idai Lu and at the same time open markets for free trade. That's because right. if China was to do that, then many of the concerns that exist ex-China 
would be wiped out and it would be a chance for China to take a leadership role in promoting peace. Because what you're talking about now is really people outside of China are just looking at it and they're concerned about, as I said, the details. And the details are very threatening to many other countries. And they need not be threatening. They could be dealt with very easily. And in that, well, not easily, they could be dealt with through simple process. And that would make China stronger and it would make the industrialized countries of the world stronger. As it is, Japan, South Korea could suffer very greatly from the mm. Dai Loop. You saw the thing. You are right. <clears throat> Let me answer your question. Two questions, actually. First, uh, about custom duties. Uh, actually, it's not all. Not all exempt from duties. Uh, there are many uh, free trade areas in China, in the southwest China, in yeah. uh, Vietnam, uh, in the north uh, west China near uh, Kazakhstan. There is also, or there are some free trade uh, areas. So there are huge uh, concessions uh, to those uh, countries bordering it, uh, sometimes as low as zero. But the free trade uh, zones are not just limited to the Belt and Road. Actually, it's part of China's uh, framework of opening up and reform. And uh, China should also open up to countries such as the US and Japan. So in uh, Shanghai, there are also many free trade zones uh, allowing trade with uh, the Western countries, developed countries. The Belt and Road also needs a lot of funds and trade. But during the, his visit, um, there was a trade deal of more than $250 billion. So the countries along the Belt and Road uh, don't uh, demand uh, lowering the uh, customs duties to, to zero, but rather improving the trading conditions. For example, uh, three, there are three railroads uh, leading into Europe, the countries along the railroads. Uh, there may be about uh, 40 points of uh, customs so the countries can collect uh, duties, but then the cost by the time it, uh, the goods reach, uh, say, France or Germany would be very expensive. So uh, under this uh, Belt and Road, the problem can be resolved. For example, take uh, Chongqing City, for example, the computers uh, a lot. Actually, one third of the computers made in the world now is manufactured in Chongqing City. So the, the customs duties uh, will be significantly lowered. And the by providing facilities, uh, the Central uh, Asian countries also benefit a lot, and Chongqing as well, because uh, it has now become one of the fastest growing uh, major metropolitans in China. Uh, its uh, GDP growth rate is more than 10%. Uh, we cannot pick up the voice uh, by the speaker. <clears throat> Why does China need to invite the U.S. and Japan to join the Belt and Road? Because there is one concept. Perhaps uh, today we need to talk about that also. First of all, we need to have policy communication. Each country has its own strategies. The U.S. has its own. For example, if the U.S. wants to punish uh, Asia, It will also deploy its uh, military power in Asia. And China has a w open uh, strategy. We need to somehow link the two strategies to find the common areas. So we 
uh, to avoid uh, confrontation uh, because uh, talking about differences, there are huge differences between the U.S. and China. How can we reach consensus under Belt and Road? That's a gradual process. The same with Japan. Uh, Prime Minister Abe also had uh, his own Silk Road uh, concept that was proposed a few years ago. And China's Belt and Road initiative is inclusive. Uh, the other countries can join without even invitation. For example, Myanmar is a very poor country. Underdeveloped country in Asia, the biggest investor are Japan and China, and the Japanese investment is bigger. And China is also gradually increasing the investment. China is also encouraging Japan to increase its investment in Myanmar. Under Belt and Road, China has been improving the investment environment in uh, Myanmar, and that benefits uh, Japan. And also, the Japanese investment in the infrastructure in Myanmar also benefits uh, China. So we need to have an interlocked uh, development. So invitation or not, that's on paper. So after that uh, paper is already issued, all the countries in the world are welcome. So whether you are deployed along the area or not, you are invited also. So. It's very clear. It's not something guided by the UN. It's just something initiated by China, but uh, something built together by all the countries. So it must be this kind of relationship. You don't use a BRI to replace the existing order in the world. That's not the way we to understand it. My understanding is that the Belt and Road Initiative is not a trade deal, right? This is, no. Th there are not trade concessions or tariff-free treatment given to Belt and Road countries. That is not a component of the Belt and with, Road with at, all this, at this point. With, with all due respect, I'm doing the business now, yeah. and I do it with Hungary, and I know that products from Hungary can enter China, not to um, not to Mianchui, not Mianchui Dichu, but mm -hmm. to China proper, duty-free. So that's what the reality is. You people should look at that because that impacts how people see all of the goodwill and all of the positive things that you want to do. Yeah. So we have to come to a compromise which will accommodate all sides. And right now, the detail of what you're doing is not doing that. That's. That's my point, and I've okay. probably Let's expanded it too long. I get apologize. the next question in, and then because we're just about out of we're just about out of time, so let me make sure that we get this. It's something gradual in terms of customs duties. You talked about Hungary and Poland. The Chinese Premier will soon be visiting those countries, and perhaps after the visit, uh, some of the customs duties will be further lowered. So it's a gradual process because customs duties involve uh, consultation, negotiation between two countries. What's interesting is that uh, Hungary, uh, Singapore, uh, or rather uh, Spain is involved, but uh, some other developed countries are not involved, like France. <laughs> Thank you for a great uh, stimulating discussion. India has staunchly uh, rejected the Idailu. Um, can you talk a little bit about the concerns that India has and how can or should China engage India? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, two months ago we had a meeting in Brazil also about uh, BRI and the cooperation uh, with the BRIC countries under BRI. And the Indian ambassador to Brazil was also the, a participant. So in principle, in addition to this initiative, uh, China and other countries have uh, frameworks of bilateral or multilateral cooperations. Of course, BRI was uh, put forward by China, it does not mean that we demand that you join us. It's not something to, uh, that you impose on. So if you want to voluntarily respond to China's initiative, we have certain uh, projects. 
of uh, investment. All of them are listed uh, on the uh, website of the National Development and Reform Commission. So for businesses and institutions, you can uh, join. So I am not just trying to force you in, as what we say that uh, uh, Something that you force in China is not tasteful. So if uh, India finds it uh, fine, then you may join. So uh, may I also add to what I said earlier, be it uh, the US, uh, Japan, or Korea, I was thinking about when China came up with a BI and initiated this construction of AIB, Korea, was the, a country that uh, barely managed to beat the deadline uh, for registration. Mm -hmm. uh, and later, there was not much movement. Later, when I uh, learned from officials of their finance ministry, I learned that uh, it wasn't until they mm -hmm. submitted the, the willingness on that day, the, the very last day of the deadline, uh, for joining the bank, the, they still face uh, pressure by the U.S. blocking them uh, for the entry. And of course, the U.S. Didn't, uh, has not joined. So let's not uh, talk about that. But now, uh, under BRI, we welcome all the countries and businesses to join. And I have seen many cases uh, in Kenyan uh, uh, projects, uh, American businesses like uh, GE also joined. So many of the U.S. Uh, enterprises have also joined. Uh, the U.S. is a capital market, actually the biggest capital market in the world, with a lot of major institutions in the financial field and also standard-setting institutions, uh, for example, credit uh, rating. And the U.S. market is the biggest in this area, too. And the green standards, how can they be implemented through such market mechanisms? I think the U.S. is a big player. It should be able to play a big role in this regard. Thank you. Uh, we're just about out of time, but Deborah and, and Mike, I just uh, wonder, do you have any, kind of in 60 seconds or so, any final thoughts or observations that you'd like to offer as we close? Deborah? Um, I'll just talk about the uh, trade issues and, and the perception. As a former trade negotiator, I think, um, you know, it's, it's the Belt and Road is in some ways viewed as threatening for the United States, and certainly that's been the reaction, although the Trump administration actually did send a senior official to attend the um, big conference that was held in Beijing. And so they're watching it very carefully to see what happens. And it's very important that, as China has stated that it will do, that it be transparent and clear in this process because in many ways this is an area where the United States and China could collaborate. The United States does not do infrastructure financing. It's a real shame and it was a major mistake that the United States was not a founding member of the Asia Infrastructure Bank. And this is a very important area. Um, as we look at what the political implications are for development in a lot of these countries. And so it really is an opportunity across many different sectors to be a cooperative project with the United States, putting trade aside, which is a whole other issue. But in terms of environmental cooperation, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of the cultural issues. And so hopefully both countries can find a way to work together on that. Mike, you have the last word. <clears throat> All right, uh, we live in a world of competing ideas and competing interests. They're truly competing interests. It's not just ideas, it's, there's different needs out there and they're colliding. And I, from the financial perspective, I would coin it this way. You know, there was a, a big regulation passed after the financial crisis called Basel III. It's a regulation of the financial community. And then in 2015, we had the Paris Climate Accord, COP21. So, uh, so Basel III is trying to reduce risk of our lending your money, and, and, and COP21 is encouraging us to take more risk and save the world, okay? So I think we live in a world of Basel III versus competing with COP21. And these are both legitimate interests. 
And we work with both of them. And I think this is, this is the, the point from a financial point of view where the universities can do valuable thought leadership of cracking the case of how can Basel III live with COP21 and we move forward. And I think Belt and Road is an element of that. It's a big element of that test case, uh, but also Africa, Latin America, there's lots of test cases here. And so, again, Basel III versus COP21, and we're working our way through that. Well, here at, at the Columbia SEPA Center on Global Energy Policy, we are very fortunate to have Han Wen come visit us and, and provide counsel and, and join our, our conference. Thank you very much, uh, Director Han. And I just especially want to thank our partners at Renmin University, Professor Xu. Um, Professor Zhao and all, all your colleagues for um, uh, all, all our work together. We're looking forward to much more work together on these topics and others in the years ahead. So please join me in giving this panel a big hand.